welcome to another episode of In Focus brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I am your host, Gwamaka Kifukwe. On tonight's program, we'll be looking at the optimism surrounding the African continent since the turn of the new millennium. This optimism has been fed by impressive growth rates recorded sometimes as early as 95 and onwards. But with growth come challenges and opportunities, particularly in maintaining that growth in the face of persistent poverty and in growing inequalities. With me in studio is Professor Finn Tarp of the United Nations University's World Institute for Development Economics Research. Professor Finn Tarp, welcome to the program. Thank you. So just to start us off, we'd like to talk about this context, this, this changing perception about Africa, this narrative of Africa rising. What, what exactly is it that, that we mean by this? What are we seeing? L lots of people mean very different things when they use that term. Mm -hmm. I think the background for it is that if you, for example, refer back to the 1980s, you saw a continent in economic decline. Africa was, as we would put it then, sliding backwards. It was, to some, a lost decade. The 90s was sort of in between, kind of recovering, reorganizing, rethinking, and struggling along. And then at a certain stage, lots of things started happening. Development did actually start speeding up. Economies started growing, and things started to happen in an economic sense, and certainly also in a political sense. So lots of the changes that those of us, myself included, who would be working uh, in Africa in the 80s, we started thinking, hmm, things are happening. And obviously for those who are Africans in their own countries and in their own places of work and living, they could see that something is happening. Economies are now starting mm. to work in a very different way. Mm -hmm. There is a very different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And incomes are rising. Sure. But, and you have, you have mentioned that you know, growth rates, for example, have been very good since about the mid-90s, give or take, for yeah. some countries, yeah. maybe a bit later for others. But despite very impressive growth rates, 7 8% and so forth, poverty remains a challenge. And, and why is that the case? When you start from a very low level, when almost everybody is poor, I'm not saying necessarily 100%, but with a very large majority of the country's population being poor, then obviously growing out of that is going to take some time. Mm -hmm. That's the first observation. It is going to take time because you cannot increase the economic size very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and then make sure that that's equivalently distributed and then arrive at your whole population being non-poor very quickly. It does take time. And, and what, are, what are the kind of factors that would allow you to either overcome that or inhibit that type of growth that you just sure. mentioned? The type of growth that I'm talking about implies that you do carefully think about how can you somewhat get a balanced development. If you do go back to some of the very uh, original models for economic development, the way in which we would be thinking about it in those contexts is that you have a traditional or agricultural sector where most people are poor. Productivity is very low, so you have a lot of people with low productivity. They're poor. And then gradually these people move out of this sector into a higher productivity sometimes manufacturing, sometimes urban sector. Mm -hmm. So then you would sort of move people, or people would move themselves from low productivity to high productivity mm -hmm. employment. Mm -hmm. And of course, if that process runs smoothly, well then gradually you get people moved out of poverty. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it doesn't always go like that. I mean, one of the things that has been characteristic as we have looked at Africa is that people have not left agriculture Mm -hmm. to move into high productivity manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have left agriculture to move into relatively low productivity service sector jobs such that their living conditions have not really improved that much. Mm -hmm. And then of course it depends a little bit, those jobs that they're moving into, are they above or below mm -hmm. the poverty line? In quite a number of countries, they actually move into those jobs, but not above the poverty line. 
So then you end up with having both the poor in the agriculture, but then also quite a few urban poor. What, what kind of factors or what kind of uh, actions, if you will, can, can be taken to, to address that kind of growth in poverty? Yeah. Um, like, how, how do you spiral out of this, as it were? Yeah. The, the, the first thing that I have to say is that I think it's incredibly important to understand that there is a challenge in relation to agriculture. And it's a challenge that I believe, it's fair to say, has not been addressed uh, to the extent it requires. It is still like this that the majority of African, African people live in the rural sector. That's where they live, that's where they produce, and that's where they should get their income. So there's a big challenge of making sure that livelihoods in that sector are improved to the extent possible. If that's done, fewer people will move with the speed that we have seen. That's one part of the challenge, is to make sure that people don't leave that sector, leave the agricultural world sector, because they feel almost like pushed out. Sure. That they are living in such conditions that they really just have to move in order to get a decent livelihood. Sure. So that's one part of the problem. Another part of the problem is then to make sure that the number of jobs mm -hmm. that are available in more urban areas mm -hmm. are there. And again here, what is required is that you have a development mm -hmm. of the manufacturing sector, that you make sure that the small, medium, and larger scale enterprises mm -hmm. that are meant to absorb these people mm -hmm that those jobs are created. Mm. This means that you create a business environment, but not just thinking about regulation, mm. but it also means that you have to create the infrastructure sure. such that enterprises can work. And, and these examples, or at least this kind of context, makes the assumption that growth itself at least is maintained at a certain level. Um, and you yourself have argued before that we don't fully understand the underlying, say, drivers of growth, if you will. Can you, can you elaborate on that just for a second? The, the, the situation is that we know a lot about what you should not do now because we are now building on many decades of development. So there are things that both uh, we as professionals but also the political leaders and the development community in general, mm -hmm. there are things that we have tried mm -hmm. and we have seen failed. Mm -hmm. We have drawn lessons. There are things we understand that we cannot ignore. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you cannot ignore the importance of incentives. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you cannot ignore the role of the state. Mm -hmm. So we now know that development is a balancing process. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, we have learned quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But when you look to uh, places where growth has certainly sparked, mm -hmm. Uh, it's not always that we fully understand what really triggered uh, this in a particular set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that uh, we really understood why exactly it was in the middle 90s mm -hmm. that growth on the African continent certainly kind of, uh, why not in 2000 or why not in uh, 1990 or, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have, I have views, I have comments on it. Mm. But we don't always understand exactly what was the trigger. Sure. For countries like Tanzania or several other sub-Saharan African countries, given that we don't fully understand what causes growth, how do you then identify and, and once you have identified, maintain a kind of successful development pathway mm -hmm. given you have very limited resources, a lot of political pressure, a lot of uh, people expecting not just within your countries or across the continent, but globally. Yeah, sure. So how is it that, that leaders, if you will, can take that risk that's necessary to make sure or to at least try this development pathway as opposed to another? Sure. I, I think that there are two things involved or two dimensions involved. One is that you constantly have to try to keep up an analytical capability mm -hmm. that can help you identify where is it that the constraining elements in your economy and in your development process are. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is an important topic because uh, lots of analysis have failed to get that right. Mm 
you will see a lot of uh, analysis coming from lots of different institutions mm -hmm. that are not really necessarily addressing the core constraints. Mm -hmm. So getting that right and having reliable both research but also general studies mm -hmm. uh, that help you understand where are the key constraints is important. Sure. Now another dimension is that you have to make choices. I mean life is about making choices and the issue is that it's very hard always to make the right choice. Sure. <laughs> I mean we know at the personal level, at the individual level, that we make choices and sometimes we make mistakes. Mm. So here it's important, I would say, for the leaders of Africa and elsewhere, that they are willing to make sure that choices are made, but also that if the wrong choices are made, then that you are willing and that you are prepared then to change those decisions when it becomes clear that they're not working. Sure. But, 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 but it's very important to stress yeah. that no decisions, no choices mm -hmm. are also that you make a choice. So it's better to make those choices with an open mind mm. um, and then be prepared to adjust when it's necessary. Sure. And I want to move on to, to another topic that has, has been kind of gaining a lot of traction in the last few years. And that's this concept of, of inequality. Mm -hmm. There's a growing concern that we're starting to see inequality on a level that is really dangerous in a lot yeah. of senses of the word. Sure. Um, can you please just elaborate what, what exactly we mean when we talk about inequality? We use different uh, terms. Now, when economists speak about inequality, mm -hmm. we basically talk about the distribution of income. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if one person owns five units of income, mm -hmm. another one earns one, mm -hmm. then we compare and then we uh, look at this and then we see this person earns five times more than the other person, mm -hmm. that's not equal. We have various indicators for measuring such inequality. We look at the whole population and then we have indicators for whether an income distribution is rather equal or is very unequal. Uh, one of the indicators we use is a Gini coefficient, but there are other ways of measuring that inequality. But effectively, it is about how unequal is the distribution of income. Sure. And to look at it from a more broad kind of development perspective, I mean, we can talk about access to, to services and all these other kinds of areas that are not necessarily um, about income. Exactly. But, but why is inequality a challenge? If, if as you were saying, it's a, if it's a question of one person earning one and one earning five, if that one is enough, is, the, is there a sense or at least a feeling that inequality at some point is unavoidable, that it's inevitable part of growth, that there will be some inequality at least for a short to medium term? Yeah. It is a very difficult discussion. Mm. Uh, le le let me tell you that when in 1978 I did my thesis, mm -hmm. I did that on growth and income distribution in developing countries. Sure. And what I actually demonstrated in that thesis was that if development mm -hmm. occurs exactly the way I spoke about, mm -hmm. so everybody in agriculture are poor, mm -hmm. Everybody in the manufacturing modern sector are above the poverty line. Mm -hmm. And if development then is that you move one person at a time mm -hmm. from the rural sector to the manufacturing sector or urban sector, mm -hmm. then actually what you are going to see, if development then takes place that way, you're then going to first see an increase in inequality and then it reaches a point and then it will turn around and then it will start going down. Mm -hmm. Inequality as measured by uh, some of these uh, standard Gini coefficients and so on. Sure. And, and, and intuitively, mm -hmm. it's not so difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. The question you correctly are, are pointing to is, is it completely inevitable? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not completely inevitable. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. But there are countries that have managed to grow very successfully mm -hmm. without inequality getting out of control. So could, Vietnam is a case. Sure. Could you maybe give some lessons on how they, they went about that? Like what, yeah, what could be sure. drawn from that? Yeah. What, what, what I believe can be drawn from that is the importance of not forgetting mm -hmm. the agricultural rural sector where the major part of the population is living. Mm -hmm. If you do not pay attention to them, mm 
Well, first of all, your poverty is going to continue mm -hmm. to be big. And the few that manage to get out of that sector mm -hmm. are going to increase the inequality, right? Because if you have a lot of poor people sure, here yeah. and then... Now, the, the, the point is to make sure that you sort of don't forget that sector, mm -hmm. that you invest actively. Mm -hmm. Do you make sure that they get access to infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Make sure that they get access to seeds, mm -hmm. better quality and so on. And it is correct to say that African governments, as well as the international development community and donors, they have not lived up mm -hmm. to what they have committed themselves to mm -hmm. in terms of attention to the agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's a very important part mm -hmm. of avoiding that this, we call it the inverted U, mm -hmm. becomes too pronounced. Sure. I'm not saying that you can, in each and every single country case, mm -hmm. that you may not have certain inequalities uh, taking place. It, it is very hard to be completely balanced. Sure, and I'm glad you brought up this, uh, this discussion about the, the state and then also the international community. I just want to focus first on the state. Give, given this, um, this context of growth and so forth, we have seen a, a kind of ideological discussion about you know, the private sector driving growth and the state should be driving growth or some kind of hybrid. What, what now is emerging as, as the role of the state in, in essentially managing, for lack of a better phrase, managing inequality? I mean, mm -hmm. who else can do that? What, what should the state be doing? The state, in my opinion, and also this is being said both as me as an individual, but also from my perspective of being a development economist who have studied these, mm -hmm. the state does have to concern itself mm -hmm. with poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. The private sector, I believe, has a major important mm -hmm. and often overlooked role mm -hmm. of making sure that enterprises work, mm -hmm. that they really profit, mm -hmm. that they expand, that they create jobs and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's a very tall order to expect the private sector mm -hmm. to how can you say, concern itself mm -hmm. in each and every case about inequality. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's a correct uh, demand that we expect from our enterprises that they behave according to laws, mm -hmm. regulations, uh, that they don't uh, swindle. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, uh, that's an appropriate expectation we can have. Mm -hmm. But we need to have legal systems that will <coughs> address them mm -hmm. when they don't do that. <coughs> but we as a community, the state, we have to address inequalities. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you try to make sure that people have equal opportunities, mm -hmm. that people are educated, that people get access to health, mm -hmm. that they can live a productive life. Mm -hmm. We make sure that we don't allow, for example, some to be left behind. Mm -hmm. This we do through our social, but also through our economic policies. Mm -hmm. And this is what is important to understand that inequality is not just some sort of thing that you can delegate over to the corner and say, our social policies will do this. Mm -hmm. You have to think about that when you make your big investments. Sure. Where should the big investments be? Well, you need to think about which are the regions mm -hmm. where poverty is large, and you therefore have to uh, invest in those areas. But there are no, how can you say, there, there, there are no, as you would say in English, there are no golden bullets. I mean, mm. it's not one simple thing. Mm. But I don't think that uh, one should just turn one's back to the issue and say, oh, it will go away by itself, because lots of experience is demonstrated. It will not go away. And just to add a further layer of complication, if sure. you will. So we've discussed now quite a lot on, on, on this balance between, say, the rural moving into manufacturing or moving into urban. But when we look at the global scale, I mean, we can see inequality there, too, between what we call the north and south, for sure. example. And even within the south, we're seeing countries that have, in, in a sense, emerged, particularly in Asia and some in Latin America. And then you still have what are broadly considered much poorer countries in, in mm -hmm. Africa, for yeah, example. Sure. How, how can we look to global institutions or regional bodies to address inequality? I mean, should, this, should inequality be treated at, at a regional level rather than at national levels as we've seen and, and so far been discussing? How, how do we do that? What, what, what I would say is that each and every nation mm -hmm. 
has a responsibility for trying to address inequality at home. Lots of the actions that we do, they do have to start at home. I also think that the richer countries of this world, whichever terminology you use, uh, I mean, you know that there, there are lots of different classifications, but those who can afford it, they have a responsibility for trying to address inequality through, and if you wish, uh, foreign aid. It's very clear that I still see that there is a role for foreign aid that needs to be played. Mm -hmm. Richer countries need to be helping and doing the right thing in making sure that they help developing countries mm -hmm. get access to export markets, mm -hmm. that they support that process rather than block it. Mm -hmm. In other words, that they get access to being able to export on a predictable basis when they can compete, that they support that process. So it's both at home, but also internationally. Whether you can sort of say that, oh, you should be concerned about um, inequality at, at the African regional level. Mm. Well, yes, I think that African leaders should, among themselves, be thinking about what they can do, mm -hmm. but I also do believe that there are very important global dimensions here that we should not uh, ignore. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to add one thing which sometimes surprises people. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, is global inequality increasing or decreasing? A lot of people mm -hmm. will say it's increasing, sure. which is not correct. No, that has surprised me. <laughs> because you see, when you look at the whole world, mm -hmm. The increase in China and India, just to take two really big countries, mm -hmm. the increase there is now lifting up so large numbers of people mm. at a rate of increase which is quite high. Mm. There's still growth in the richest countries, but actually that growth is smaller. Mm. So you are not actually now seeing inequality, relative inequality, decreasing. Because you also have countries in Latin America where you have seen inequality falling. Mm -hmm. There are also others in Asia where inequality is rising and I would say by and large there are lots of indications that inequality has been increasing mm -hmm. uh, in Africa. But when you take the sum of all this, mm. global inequality, at least at the interpersonal, uh, so when you treat every person as an individual, mm. has actually been falling. Well, it's good news, I would assume. So it's, it's just, uh, uh, but I, I know it's a difficult uh, discussion, and, mm. and, and of course one needs to be very careful not to use that as an excuse, sure. uh, not to be concerned about it, because of course, well, why do you have progress in China at that speed? That's not necessarily something that is a success mm -hmm. uh, for other uh, players or, or stakeholders in the global economy. Mm -hmm. And, and just to come back to the, the idea of, of thinking as a region again, um, and to tie us back to what, what we started off with, if we've seen now this, this idea of, of Africa rising, and particularly an excitement about an African middle class, mm -hmm. to, to what extent is it that we should be looking at inequality as an African problem, just to come back to that? And the reason I, I kind of pick this up is, as it, foreign investors come in, and as we look to this middle class as a, a, a consumer, mm -hmm. rather than just a producer of, of raw materials for the global economy, mm -hmm. this will imply a kind of integrated Africa, because it's an African middle class rather than middle classes in, in Africa, as it were. Mm -hmm. Does this force us to, to think at, at greater scales, rather than just looking at it at, at sort of local communities and so forth? It's very clear that, in general, African economies are so small mm -hmm. that you do have to think beyond your own borders. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are a few really big economies like Nigeria or South Africa, mm -hmm. but in general, mm -hmm. uh, an African, typical African economy is so small that you have to basically see yourself as being trying to relate uh, to your neighbors, mm -hmm. to try to see where are the bigger markets, mm -hmm. to try to get your production up to scale, mm -hmm. you have to think about that. And that's also why I mentioned that you do have to even look to export markets beyond Africa. It is in order to be able to grow up to a scale where you can actually be competitive. 
And of course, um, there are lots of things that African countries can do to promote the regional collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, it's still uh, a problem that, for example, to move uh, from one neighboring African country to another often is more complicated uh, than getting uh, on a plane and traveling to Europe and getting into Europe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, there are very big challenges here in making sure that you do not get in the way of the development process. And there are lots of things that can be done in Africa. Of course, with one very important observation, which is that Africa is still facing a very major infrastructure challenge. Mm -hmm. To move from one country to another, well, you have to have some kind of road mm -hmm. or some kind of rail link mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. that will help that. And that investment, in many cases, still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But of course, while that happens, it's a good idea not to put other constraints in the way. Sure. And then just to, to kind of wrap up this, this discussion about growth and, and poverty in, in Africa, is there, is there anything else that you feel is very important to highlight to the audience or anything you feel that really the audience should take away on this discussion of, of, of the importance of recognizing and addressing inequality, but also maybe their expectations for growth in, in Africa more broadly? Yeah. You, you, you're mentioning the word expectations, and, and, and that is indeed a very, very important uh, aspect of present policy discussions. Mm -hmm. You will, in, in some corners, you will also, while you find the Africa rising, you will also in some corners find a certain element of pessimism. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had growth, and then it said, oh, but you have practically no uh, poverty reduction, um, so Africa is still not doing mm -hmm. uh, better, it's still um, mm -hmm. with lots of issues and so on. I think one thing I want to stress here is that, and, and that's based actually on, on, on quite in-depth research, mm -hmm. the poverty elasticity, the growth poverty elasticity, this means the rate with which poverty will be decreasing as you have growth, is bound to be somewhat lower in Africa, at least for a while. When you, for example, compare a country like Vietnam with a country like Mozambique, mm -hmm. where we have compared the economic structures, mm -hmm. because of the economic structures of Mozambique, you get less impact for the same policies. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Vietnam is a much tighter integrated economy. Mm -hmm. In Mozambique, you still have big areas of land with no infrastructure. Yeah. It's not connected. Trade margins are high, transport costs are very high, so you are going to have less poverty reducing impact for the same policies, at least for some time. So one comment I would make is, please stay on course. I mean, just because the rate of decrease in poverty is not as much as you would have liked it to be, make sure that your, uh, that your economic policies and your social policies are focused on reducing poverty and reducing inequality. And, and on that note, thank you very much for joining us on, on In Focus and welcome back to the program on another point. Thank you very much. You. I appreciate <laughs> it.